In the story this evening, we are continuing directly from where we stopped in the previous Bible study. And we're going to look at Matthew chapter 12 from verse 15 to verse 21. I'll start by reading the text and then I go on to explain uh, a few things. In Matthew 12 verse 15 we are told, But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself uh, from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was pro uh, spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold, my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall shew judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flat shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. That's the passage we are studying tonight. And it begins with the uh, phrase saying, But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself. And the question that will come to anybody's mind at that point will be, What did Jesus know? What made Jesus to withdraw himself? Well, if you remember from the last Bible study we had in the preceding verses to this, you will notice that Jesus has performed a miracle on the Sabbath day. And the people, want, uh, the Pharisees, be, uh, be, became envious of it. They were moved with anger and they made up their mind. In fact, they consulted with other people and took counsel together. In other words, they reached agreement. They plotted that they were going to kill Jesus Christ simply because Jesus Christ did something that was good. Uh, but he did it on a Sabbath day, which they thought was wrong. But whereas they did not understand the full mind and the full intent of this, the gospel. So they took counsel to kill Jesus Christ. And this passage we just read today is following on directly from there. That when Jesus knew that they have taken counsel to kill him, when Jesus knew they have plotted to kill him, when Jesus knew they wanted to kill him, Jesus withdrew himself from that area, went somewhere else. And of course, the multitudes followed him, and we are told what followed next. Now, in those few faces that I've read to us, as I meditated and pondered over it, I could see something that stand out. Because when Jesus withdrew himself, he did some other things. And then, just like many of these writers of the Bible, when they write something about what Jesus has done or why Jesus did it, they then end up by saying that it might be fulfilled what was prophesied of him. Or sometimes they say this was in fulfillment of the prophecy that was made concerning uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one thing that really uh, uh, thrilled me in this is that this prophecy that was fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ here is not something that maybe a prophet that was living at that time came and told Jesus Christ, this is, a, uh, this is what I prophesy about you now. I'm not saying that that is wrong. No, it's not wrong. Sometimes people can come to us, prophesy something, and it can come to pass. Uh, but here... The prophecy that is referred to here is actually a prophecy that was recorded in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah lived and died about 700 years before Jesus Christ was born. So, how did Jesus know that this was a prophecy from him? He read the Bible. He read the scriptures. He understood that this was written concerning him. Actually, when Isaiah wrote that, Isaiah did not mention that this prophecy is meant for Jesus Christ. He didn't mention it like that. 
but he was just saying this is the prophecy relating to the servant of the Lord. And that was one of the terms that was used for the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, when Jesus saw that, he could have just said, oh, he was for a servant of the Lord. Maybe it was for prophet Isaiah or for prophet Jeremiah or for other servants of the Lord. But he read, he knew, this thing is written concerning me. Do you know, as you read the Bible today, you may come across prophecies, promises that are also made for you. You may not find your name written there that this prophecy is written for Sarah or for Mary or for James or for Peter uh, 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 for this particular generation. It may just say, this is for those that believe. And it is for you to recognize, am I a believer? Is this promise made for me? If it is, can I claim it? If I claim and I pray on it, can it come to pass in my life? This was a kind of situation. Jesus read the Bible. He knew that this was a prophecy made for the servant of the Lord. And he knew he was the servant of the Lord. The Messiah that was to come. And the one that was sent by God to preach the gospel. And Jesus tuned himself to it. And in fact, in earlier passages that we read, uh, uh, even last Sunday, we saw Jesus Christ going into the temple and the book of Isaiah was given to him and he found the place where it was written and he knew it was written concerning him. He read that passage uh, which is recorded in Luke chapter 4 and at the end of it he told the people that were listening to him, uh, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So the same way too we find that the Lord can speak to us through uh, the Bible, he can speak to us through what has been written. And when you come across a scripture like that that was written, you need to uh, 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 receive it. Know that it is for you and that God that gave that word will certainly bring it to pass, bring it to fulfillment in your word. If you will believe, if you will claim, if you will stand on that promise and never uh, a doubt, Never did that here and there. So as we look at this passage, I want to maybe focus on the pathway to prophetic fulfillment. And you can call it a different way. You can call it a compass to prophetic fulfillment. You can call it a, a route to prophetic fulfillment that a route is sometimes pronounced, well, in this part of the world, is pronounced as root, R-O-U-T. Uh, the root to prophetic pro uh, pronouncement in America, they pronounce it as root, uh, to prophetic uh, fulfillment. So, that's the kind of thing I want to focus on today. But it's based on that passage that we are we are praying. I want to point out some steps, so some things we can notice from this. And of course, actually I could expand it to include other people in the Bible. We could have talked about other people that this thing applied to. But time will not permit us uh, to go into all those other examples. Maybe just to mention one in passing. Look at uh, uh, even the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was prophesied that Jesus would be born at Bethlehem. Where was Mary living? At the time Mary was pregnant. At the time Mary was near to they're delivering the baby. Mary was living in Nazareth. Nazareth was not the place where the Bible said Jesus would be born. It was Bethlehem is that it was said. But look at that time. It wasn't like it is today where it is easy to travel from one place to the other. Uh, uh, there was a decree made that censors should be conducted and everybody should travel down to their native town to be uh, a county, and the native town was Bethlehem. Joseph could have given excuse and said, look, uh, Mary, my wife is pregnant, it's very heavy, we can't go now. Maybe other people will represent us. But you notice something I, I, I learned from them. Mary herself could have said, no, we are now nine months, uh, it, it's too late. If I take this long journey on horseback, uh, something may happen on the road. Joseph, you go yourself. When you go, include me in the camp. Let me stay back here. But you notice the simplicity of these people. They said a king, and that king was not a godly person. 
A king has made a decree. He said we should all travel down to our native town. Let us go down to the native town. They travel long journey on foot, on, uh, on, 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 on asses, and so on. Long journey <clears throat> to travel from Nazareth right down to that place. And when they got to Bethlehem, the Bible tells us it was time for the baby to be born. And Mary gave birth to the baby right then. And it was put in a manger because there was no place in the inn. Uh, in a, a kind of hotel at that time, although it wasn't formally called a hotel. Uh, there was no place for them in that uh, public houses, so they had to stay in a, <coughs> in, a, uh, in a, a manger. He gave birth, and then the prophecies became fulfilled. Do you notice simple obedience? Did they know much of the Bible at that time that this uh, baby is supposed to be born in Bethlehem. I don't know because copies of the Bible were not widely available at that time. But all those are speculations right now. Maybe they knew. Maybe they didn't know. If they knew, why did they stay in Nazareth even when uh, the baby was almost nine months uh, in the womb? They could have moved down there on their own and said, let's go down because this is the prophecy. But maybe they didn't know. May God use an ungodly uh, king to make a decree, which is why God tells us we need to obey the people that are in authority over us. You see, by that simple obedience to people that were in authority over them, it led to the fulfillment of a prophecy that was over 700 years old in their life. Simple obedience to the word of God. Simple obedience to what you know God wants you to do. Simply taking the steps in the right direction, even when it is not convenient, even when you don't feel like doing so, even when you have other preferences and so on, can lead <clears throat> To the fulfillment of prophecies in your life whether you know it or not now look at this passage jesus was just preaching the gospel he happened to pass through uh, a, a particular place on a sabbath day when he saw this sick individual and he, uh, he healed that individual and the Pharisees and so on became angry. Why should you heal on Sabbath day? Sabbath is the day of rest. You are uh, healing on a Sabbath day. Is walking. Well, Jesus answered them. But after answering them, they were not satisfied with the anger. They picked quarrel and they made up their mind. We are going to kill him because we can't win by argument. He, he will out talk us. He will answer all our questions. He will put us to shame uh, if we just want to talk. It's not going to change. They decided, let us kill him. The Bible tells us when Jesus knew that they plotted to kill him, Jesus decided to move away from that place to another place. So let's learn some lessons from all this. What can we learn from that single act that when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from them? Couldn't Jesus say, well, I am the son of God. My time for death uh, to die has not yet come. Jesus knew when he was going to die. Couldn't he just say, I ignore that I continue to be here and preach the gospel and do whatever I need to do. The Bible says Jesus moved away. What do I learn from that? That even though Jesus knew and was certain that God will protect him, divine protection was there. Angels were around to protect him, but Jesus did not expose himself unnecessarily to danger. And that reminds us that genuine faith is not foolishness. And we can't say, well, I have so much faith in God. I know the Bible promised that if I eat anything that is poisonous unknowingly, that that thing will not harm me. And you see poison, you know it is poison, and say, well, I have divine protection. I'll take it and drink to prove to you that poison cannot have any effect in me. You may die as a result of it. That's foolishness. That is putting God to test. That is attempting God. I heard of a real, I think I read it on a, a newspaper, about a man that uh, decided to go into a, a lion's den in a zoo. He says, Daniel was in the lion den. And the lions could not do him any, any, any harm. He tells us that God can protect a, 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 any believer, any Christian, from harm and danger of lion. And therefore, as Daniel was in the lion's den, 
I also will enter this lion's den uh, because I'm a child of God and a minister of the gospel. And this lion will not do me anything. I'm going to pray and bind the mouth of this lion. And this man went in, entered into the lion's uh, uh, enclave within that zoo. And guess what happened? The lion was so happy for such fresh meal. They just pounced on him, kill him, ate him, finish him dead. He didn't come out alive. Now, why was Daniel in the lion's den? Did Daniel walk into a lion's den of his own volition? No. It's simply because Daniel did not want to compromise his faith. He decided to keep on praying even when the edict was made that nobody should pray to any god except the king for 30 days. Daniel says, I am a child of God. I must continue to obey God. And they decided to take him, put him in the lion's den. God intervened. God uh, uh, performed a miracle. So, it doesn't mean we should be foolish and act foolishness uh, uh, in our situation. Expose ourselves to unnecessary danger. No, if we expose ourselves to unnecessary danger, we could face the consequences of those dangers. And it doesn't mean that God failed to protect or God's promises has failed. No, we're simply paying the price for our foolishness. So Jesus knew this is what they wanted to do. And Jesus knew his time has not come. He still has to preach the gospel in other places. Jesus simply moved away from them. Move away from their anchor. Move away from danger. Move to another place and carry on preaching the gospel. Now, we are told in that verse 15, And great multitude followed him. And he healed them all. This is wonderful. You know, another title we would have given to this topic would have been healing for all. Or Jesus healed everybody. That is still true. And that could, uh, is still applicable to everyone uh, today. But I think this title of the roadway, the road map, the, uh, the pathway to prophetic fulfillment is more appropriate at this point because of the things we are looking at. So Jesus moved away to this other place and guess what happened? Multitudes of people followed him. Do you know Jesus could have felt that, look, it was preaching to people and healing that made the Pharisees want to kill me. In that place and I ran away to this place is these people following me now if I continue to perform miracles more Pharisees will take offense at me and they will want to kill me maybe I should keep quiet maybe I should just uh, 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 play it cool calm it down and not do m as much in this place as I did in the other now Jesus Christ understood that the reason I came into this world is to preach the gospel, is to heal the sick, is to make people know the way of God. And Jesus was committed for, to, fulfill, to fulfilling God's purpose for his life. Now, when you too are committed to fulfilling God's purpose in your life, whether it is easy or not, whether there is opposition or not, it will pave the way for the promises of God to be fulfilled in your life. So when Jesus saw those multitudes coming around and standing around, Jesus Christ preached to them and the Bible says he healed them all. There is nobody that failed to receive his healing. Can I tell you, that sickness in your body, that problem you are going through, there is healing solution for it even today in Jesus' name. Jesus will heal you. God will heal you. God has given us the promise that he will heal. I know there is a lot of skepticism today. And some people may even say, well, I have already prayed and prayed and prayed. I don't see anything happen. I, I can't see miracles. Some people say they get miracles, but I don't experience it in my own. I, I, I said, maybe it's not true. I don't want to hear anybody tell me so. And so again, keep on believing. Keep on trusting God because God never fails. God heals. God will deliver and God will set free. So Jesus continued with his purpose. He did not want to abort his mission because of the hatred, the anger of the Pharisees, because of what has happened in the other uh, 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 town. No, he made up his mind. I'm not going to ab abort my mission. The same thing should apply to me and you. 
that the anchor of the enemy, the hatred of the enemies, must not drive us into hiding, must not drive us into inactivity to say, oh no, I don't want to do this again, let uh, so-and-so become angry uh, with me, uh, so-and-so uh, maybe want to uh, 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 kill me. No, we must be about our masters, our father's business, knowing fully well that God has promised that even the very hairs on our head are counted a number. And he will not allow one to fall to the ground without his knowledge. And that same God has given us the assurance that even if, in fact, Jesus preaching to the disciples told them, don't fear those that kill the body, and after that, they have nothing else they can do. So that tells us, even if they kill, I mean, what are they going to do? It's only the physical body. We need to understand the glorious uh, 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 destiny that is on the other side of a person being a matter for God. But you see, Jesus didn't want to die prematurely without fulfilling his commission, so he moved to another town. But when he moved in, he continued focusing on the purpose of God, the mission of God. What do you know of God's plan for your life, God's purpose for your life? If you don't know, find out, pray. Ask God to reveal to you. And when you know it, stick to it. Remain faithful to it. No matter what is happening, no matter what is going on, no matter what people are trying to do, remain faithful to it. Because as you remain faithful to it, you are paving the path, you are walking on the road that will lead to fulfillment of the promises you've been quoting and believing for in the Bible, in the Word of God. And, and, I mean, it wasn't the first day Jesus started his ministry that this prophecy was fulfilled. That tells you it may not be the first day that you start or stand on a promise that it will be fulfilled. But if Jesus has stopped and uh, continued in the purpose he came to this, uh, this world, this prophecy will never have been fulfilled in his life. And so Jesus healed everybody. And when Jesus healed everybody, what do we notice? In verse 16, we are told after the healing, Jesus charged them that they should not make him known. And you may wonder, why was Jesus doing this? Because if they made him known in other places all over, more people will come, more people will receive the miracle. But this also tells us what was the motive of Jesus Christ healing the people. It wasn't to attract unnecessary attention or the wrong type of attention to himself. You know, so, uh, some attention can, dis can distract you from doing what you need to do. Jesus wanted to continue focusing doing what he needed to do. If those people went and broadcast, maybe they may have even gone to the same group of Pharisees that wanted to kill him and say, look, we know where, uh, this is what is happening and they now know where he is and come over to that place to distract him. Jesus didn't want that at all. He didn't want to uh, maybe just focus or use that to uh, uh, raise uh, his popularity or whatever. He wanted to focus on the substance, the reality, what he was here to do rather than just popularity, advertisement, or uh, 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 attracting the wrong type of attention. That is very, very important. And because Jesus was focused on that, then the writer of this book now uh, uh, recognized what the prophet this one didn't tell them at that moment. The reason I'm telling you not to tell anybody is so that this prophecy will be fulfilled. It was a writer, Matthew, the writer of this epistle, that now thought, why did Jesus say this? Why did Jesus take this step? And he remembered, oh, this is the prophecy that was made concerning him. And he, he, he wrote out those prophecies. And I said that prophecy was in the book of Isaiah. Now, what was the prophecy? The point number four, we are told, that is in verse 18, down to verse, uh, actually to the end of it, verse 21. But I will first look at uh, verse 18 to 20. Later on, I will come to verse 21. But remember that verse 21 is still part of the prophecy that was fulfilled. And uh, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah the prophet is the way it is written there. But it's referring to prophet Isaiah saying, verse 18, Behold, 
my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him. And he shall shew judgment to the gentle. He shall not strive nor cry. Neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flask shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. That's a wonderful prophecy. Jesus' knowledge of the scripture was the driving force in his ministry. Let your knowledge of the scripture, your knowledge of the promises of God, your knowledge of what God tells you be the driving force for your commitment to God, for your service to God, for your willingness to obey God, and for your wanting to know God. He knew what was written about him, and he persistently went about to fulfill them. When your life, your faith, your actions and behaviors are driven by God's promises in his word, your life will move mountains, will cross rivers, will quench the violence of fires, will calm storms and accomplish great feasts for God. It will lead to fulfillment of God's promises for your life. The people you come in contact with will become so blessed that they will glorify God because they knew you, because they came in contact with you. Now, I want you to consider the different facets in that promise, uh, the, the prophecy concerning Jesus Christ. And I want you to think about this concerning yourself. I'll think about myself as well. Remembering what Jesus Christ said, that if you love me and serve me and fear me, then I and my Father will come and live in you. And that means Jesus Christ is living inside of me, living inside of you. If Jesus is living in you, and these were the prophecies that were made about him, and those prophecies were fulfilled, do you realize that those prophecies are also applicable to you? You can claim them, they can be fulfilled in your life, even today. What were the whole did the prophecies behold? My servant whom I have chosen. The Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. You are among the chosen. I am among the chosen. So God is talking to you right now. You are the servant of the Lord. I am the servant of the Lord. And God has chosen us. He says, you have not chosen me, but I choose you. That is why he sent Jesus to die for us years before we were even thinking of salvation. My beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. God is pleased with us because we have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our life. And God said here, yeah, I will put my spirit upon you. Is that not what God tells us? That when we give our life to Jesus Christ, God will seal us with the Holy Spirit. He will fill us with the Holy Spirit so you can claim this for yourself. He shall show judgment to the Gentiles. That is wonderful. I'll come to that when we look at verse 21 because both in this verse 18 and verse 21, it talks about the Gentiles. I'll come to the significance of that. <clears throat> He shall not strive nor cry. That means quarrel and strife and fighting is not part of your life. That is why Jesus, instead of standing with those Pharisees, striving with them, fighting them, commanding them to fall down and so on, uh, uh, he could have done that, but he decided not to. That was not the time for that. He moved away to another place. Strife is not part of a believer's life. And uh, he shall, uh, um, a bruised reed shall he not break. People that are weak, Jesus is not there to destroy them. He's not there to say, oh, you are too weak. Why don't you understand this? I've been talking about this over and over. No, he leave them alone. He understand that not everything will be understood at one go. Even with the disciple that he, he, he selected, that walked with him day and night for three and a half years, towards the end of the ministry, Jesus said, there are many other things I want to teach you. But you cannot bear them now. There will be too much. Uh, it will be like a, 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 a too much download for your brain. 
but I will send the Holy Spirit after I have gone, and the Holy Spirit will lead you to all truth. So Jesus was well, very understanding towards people that are weak, towards people that are feeble. He says, a smoking flag shall he not quench till he send forth judgment unto victory. In dealing with people, he was gentle, he was wise, so, so that he doesn't end up breaking anybody before they get to the point of knowing the full truth and becoming saved and born again. The same approach we need to adopt in our relationship with other people. Now, I come to verse 21 now, which is uh, the end of that uh, uh, part of the passage. And it says, in his name shall the Gentiles trust. So you find that word again, Gentiles, mentioned in that passage. Who were the Gentiles? Well, at the time uh, that this was written, there were only two people grouped in the world, the Jews and the Gentiles. If you were not a Jew, automatically you were a Gentile. And so today, uh, we would class ourselves as falling into the group of the Gentiles by that definition because we were not born in Israel, in, in, in Jewish land. But why was this particularly mentioned? The question, of course, you could ask is, are they Gentiles today in the world? Yes, they are. And that means this promise that we've already gone through here applies to Gentiles as well. Because Isaiah said, and remember, Isaiah prophesied this 700 years before Jesus Christ came. When Jesus Christ came, even though he started his ministry in, uh, in Israel, but he was focused on the whole world. The Bible tells us that uh, he died for the whole world. In other words, his mission was not limited to the Jews alone. But why was this uh, uh, prophecy by Isaiah? Why did it mention the Gentiles? And why is it mentioned here in this point? Why? The reason is because the Jewish people felt that we are the only people that God loves. We are the only people that the word of God should come to. We are the only people that have the, 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 the law of God. Do you know, even at the time Jesus was here, physically on earth, that the attitude of the Jews was that we have nothing to do with the Gentiles. They wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. They wouldn't associate with the Gentiles. But they ignored what prophet Isaiah had prophesied about. You remember when the Holy Spirit spoke to Peter and said, Peter, go to Cornelius out. Uh, 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 because I have sent him, uh, I'm the one that sent uh, uh, him to call you. Peter could have said no. He started with a revelation. A, in a dream, he was hungry, food was being prepared. And while he, a, a, the food was being prepared, he fell asleep. And he saw a dream. In the dream, a tray came down with all sorts of animals, clean animals, some clean animals, and a voice told him, Peter, rice, kill, and if you're hungry, this is food for you. And he looked at it, he says, oh no, God, from my bed, I never eat anything unclean. They had all those traditions, uh, uh, laws, and so on. And the voice repeated three times, and then the tray disappeared, and Peter woke up. And he was wondering, uh -uh, what does this mean? What does this dream mean? While he was thinking about it, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He says, uh, uh, Peter, there are two Gentiles on your doorstep coming to call you to go and visit a Gentile. Normally you will say, no, you are Gentiles. I can't go with you. I can't do anything. And he says, go with them. Don't doubt anything because I have sent them. Peter got up. He went with them. Come to the Gentile house, Cornelius, the centurion. Centurion is a commander of 100 soldiers. And he says, why did you send for me? And then he started preaching. As he started preaching and sharing, Holy Ghost descended upon them. The same Holy Ghost baptism that the apostles and the 120 in the upper room received on the day of Pentecost. And Peter said, when he saw that, he became convinced that God has accepted the Gentiles. But was it not prophesied? Even in the Old Testament, it was there. The tradition had made them to exclude the Gentiles from the word of God, the preaching of the gospel. And so God was confirming. When Peter saw that, Peter said, well, who am I? If God has given them the same Holy Spirit that he gave to us, who am I 
to uh, discriminate against them. And he, he called them, baptized them. When Peter came back to Jerusalem, do you remember what happened? The rest of the elders, the apostles, they called Peter to judgment, to the council. He says, Peter, how dare you? One of us, a disciple, high-ranking disciple of Jesus Christ, how dare you go to the Gentiles and live with the Gentiles and eat with the Gentiles? And Peter started explaining all that happened. And when they heard, eventually their anchor was swayed. But why were they like that? You see, the key message and why this was put in the Bible was for these people to know that God does not discriminate against anybody. God does not discriminate against men, against women, against the old, against the young, against the color or whatever. The gospel is meant for everybody. And God wanted to make clear that even the Gentiles are included in the gospel benefit, in the gospel right. You know, sometimes there may be a, a specialized ministry to, space, to some specific group of people. Like we say, okay, let's have class for children. Uh, we used to have that when we had uh, little children in the group. There's nothing wrong about that. Uh, you, you are special. Uh, you having that special group just to teach the little children in the way they will understand because if they are among the adult class, they may not understand, they may get bored and all whatnot. But then there's nothing wrong about that. While you are doing that, you children come to a point that says the gospel is only meant for little children, not for adults. Adults, you can go to hell. But uh, for little children, let's preach to, to, to you. And you may have other uh, meetings. Like the, sometimes people may say, we want to have a meeting specially for women only. That's fine. There is nothing wrong about that. To have a meeting for women only because you want to preach to the women, address women issues, go into practical details of things that you, that you may not feel free to talk about in a meeting with all of that. But you mustn't come to a situation where you think that the gospel is only for women. Men, you forget about you have been excluded. You, you can't have any right to this. And we can talk about all other groups like that. The gospel is for everybody. The message is for everyone. And when anybody receives the gospel, uh, you will find that God will receive that person and take that person to head to earth to heaven. But in today's study, can you notice and see here how Jesus Christ fulfilled this prophecy that was written about him in the Bible about 700 years before he came simply because he was focused, he was faithful, he didn't allow the problems and dangers to hinder him from focusing on what God wants him to do. The same way too, if you make up your mind, I make up my mind, I'm going to concentrate, focus on God, keep on believing, keep on praying, keep on doing what God wants me to do, no matter what is happening there, no matter what we are saying that no matter the danger, I will keep on doing what God wants me to do. You will pave the way to, to having the promises, the things you are believing God for in the Bible. Whether that is deliverance, is healing, is uh, progress, whatever it may be, you will have paved the way for those promises to be fulfilled in your life. Let's go to God right now in prayer and you will talk to God and say, God, help me to walk in the pathway that will lead to fulfillment of promises and prophecies in my life. Help me to follow that roadmap that will lead me to fulfillment in promises and prophecies. Talk to God right now and God will do it for you in Jesus' name.